Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if this is your first time stopping by. Today, we are going to be doing a tarot and oracle deck anti-haul. If you are new to my anti-haul series, this is a series I created to just sort of inject some realism, I guess, into my own experience with tarot and oracle decks. I bring in a lot for both review, for personal use, etc., here on the channel. And I like to sort of counterbalance that by sharing with you the things that I've talked myself out of, that I was very tempted by, but I managed to sort of like use what I have instead. And so my focus on this video series is to share with you the things I talked myself out of buying and the things from my own collection. As you can see, I have a lot of decks hanging behind me on the walls. The things from my own collection that I really feel like can sort of scratch that itch is the phrase I tend to use a lot. So the thing that sort of fills that niche for me, I personally find that there is a sort of threshold after which I start to feel like decks that I'm keeping feel more like clutter and less like usable tools. I want my decks to, for the vast, vast majority of what I have, I want it to feel like something I'm reaching for that I want to use that has a purpose in my collection. And that's really important to me personally. Your mileage may vary. Some people love to have huge collections and they're happy with just collecting. And some people want to use everything they have. Some people like a minimal, a minimal amount of decks, maybe even just one or two. And some of us like to work with a whole great many in a variety of ways. So I sort of fall into this space where I definitely like to collect decks. I like having a huge variety to work with, but there is this point at which it's too much. And that's the point at which I typically tend to declutter, change things up, uh, move some things out so that I can bring other things in. But I try to sort of keep around the size of collection I have now. And despite being on tarot tube here for gosh, five years now, I find that my collection has hit that point where it just doesn't really get bigger. So for everything that comes in, usually there's at least something going out. So that is sort of where I'm at. That being said, I do enjoy working with a lot of variety and I enjoy reviewing new decks. I enjoy getting my eyeballs on new decks, on creators, uh, sort of perspectives on the tarot. I just find that to be something that really excites me. So with all of that sort of context out of the way, let's get into it. I've scooted over. I've scooted over, is that the right verb? Uh, I scooted, I scooted over so that we have space on the screen so that I can show pictures of things that I don't actually own because we're gonna be talking about some things I don't have in my possession. Now, this first section in the video, I like to talk about decks that I've decided I'm not keeping and the things from my collection that fill that same need for me and that I've figured out are good enough, right? So the first thing I wanna talk about is the Somnia Tarot. I will put a picture up because I don't have it anymore. It's already off to a new home. This was one of those decks I just could not get out of my head and I knew I wasn't going to know for sure how I felt about it until I had it in hand. I followed the art creation of this deck well before the Kickstarter launched. I was confident I was going to back it, but then I stopped myself, I didn't back it. And then several months later, I regretted that and wanted to get my hands on it. So this is definitely one of those purchases that I guess I regret. It was really cool to get my eyes on this deck in person. And I ended up pulling it in to use during a monthly reading stream. So I do these really long live streams once a month for my channel members at the Magical and Badass Unicorn Tears. And I do live readings. And um, I used it in there and I, it, we did not get along me in this deck. Like it was very clear during that stream that I, I didn't want to use it. Like I got halfway through the stream and, and if people had requested that deck, I was like, well, I guess, you know, it was just like, it was not a good time. And I'm not entirely sure where the disconnect is. I think the art is beautiful. Like the photograph, photograph. Wow. I said that very weird. The pictures are real pretty. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of basic way, thing I'm trying to say. The pictures were really, really well done. It's It astounds me artistically. I think it's really impressive and it's very poignant, but for whatever reason, I got nothing from it from uh, as far as reading with it went. So I decided to let it go. And I was thinking about what in my collection does that same kind of job that I think I thought it was going to do for me. And it's a no brainer. And maybe this is why I shouldn't have gotten it, but my Deviant Moon Tarot. So. I've talked about this deck so much on the channel, um, but I love the Deviant Moon. This is the Borderless Edition. It's mass market, it's really affordable. It does such a great job of helping me see the shadow in situations. It is my go-to for looking at sort of the darker side of things. And this deck has really never, I've never found another deck that does as good of a job as this one. And I think that's maybe what I thought the Somnia was going to do was this kind of work. And I should have known because when it comes to calling myself out, like this is the one that I reach for. I don't necessarily need another one. And I have, I threw, I threw the guidebook. Did you see that? <laughs> um, I have actually even used this for clients 
maybe client. It may have only been one client reading I ever used this. And it was such a good reading. It was such a connected experience. Um, and typically, I won't use this for others because I don't always know if it's going to land. So it's a bit of a risk to pull it for a client. But um, when I have that time that I did, <laughs> should be more specific, that time that I did, it was just really, really on point. And when I read for myself with this deck, it's really good. And you know, I should bring this into my member readings because I don't know if I had. I don't know if I've, I don't know if I have. Yeah, this is probably going to go, if I can remember, this will go on my next monthly reading stream for Magical and Badass Unicorns. Because yeah, I, I really want to use this for others more and at least those who are open to it. So anyways, okay, I'm going to set that aside. But that was the first one that I didn't keep. And if I talk about every one of these for this long, we are going to be here for a bazillion hours. Hopefully you don't mind. I'm in a chatty mood, I guess. Okay, the next one that I decided not to keep, I do still have. I haven't even put it on my rehome list officially yet, but I know it's not staying and I'm gutted about it. And in fact, I'm also gutted that in the 21 tarot questions tag that's been going around that Peggy started for us, um, that I didn't list this one as decks that I love but hate the cardstock. Um, but it turned out the cardstock was the deal breaker for me on this. And it's, I think it's really good. It's the Cantigy Oracle. Cantigy, I think somebody said it's Cantigy. This is a mass market Oracle deck and the art is by Laura Zuspan who created the, I always forget the name of it and I don't know why, literally, I always forget. It's oval. I can picture it in my mind. I reach for it for like really, really intuitive readings. This happens to me. I'm, I don't know what it is about that deck. There's something about that deck that I can never remember the name of it. I literally have to like look it up every single time. Somebody's hollering at their screen. And I don't want to like pause this video and go look it up. This is just, it's crazy. It's just this one specific deck that this happens to. And I know the deck very, very well. I can picture the cards in my mind. Okay, we're moving on. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I put it, I'm going to have put it on the screen because editing me is going to be super irritated <laughs> watching this back. Okay, anyways, the Cantigui, I got very, very excited about this because this deck has, it's, it calls itself an ecological, ecological spiritual guide and creative prompt deck. Now, the reason I bought this was because, A, I love Laura Zespin's artwork. I find it very intuitive and evocative. Um, so I was very excited, but also this. Look at this chonker of a guidebook. It is no less than 326 pages, 27 pages. And every guidebook entry has tons of really great information. The guidebook is incredible. If they fix this, I will probably repurchase it if they fix the stock issue. But the cardstock issue was such an incredible deal breaker that I can't. So it's a round deck. And Peggy, I can hear her voice in my mind right now. Lisa, you don't like round decks. I feel like that's not objectively true. And yet, I managed to rehome every round deck I get. I don't think it's entirely because it's round. My issue with the Cantigui Oracle isn't even that it's round. It's that it warps so badly just hanging out. Like this is it, just hanging out. I hadn't even shuffled it. And this is, by the way, what it looks like after I pressed it under like six of my largest books for like two weeks solid without touching it. And, I, and this is the improved version of how warped it was. It was so intensely warped that it made me mad. <laughs> like I was mad at this deck. Um, if you haven't seen it, this is what the backings look like. And the frontings, they may not be all upright because I am a little further from my camera than I normally am. Gosh, I really love this pelvis. I know it's not pelvis, it's ears. In my brain, it looks like a pelvis. I think it's both. To me, it's a pelvis and it's ears. I don't know. It says your ears have become a butterfly. But anyways, I really love the artwork. I even like the wonky titles on the cards. It is shiny. And the cardstock is kind of thin, but like, I'm not kidding. Like, look at this. Like, look at it. Why though? And like some decks will do this when you first get them, which is why I held on to it for as long as I did. And then, you know, the humidity balances out in your space or you put it next to a humidifier or you press it or you shuffle it and it gets better. No, every time I shuffled this, it just got worse. And it made me it just made me, it made me mad. It made me mad because I want to work with this, but the warping really, really bothers me. And um, I was afraid to keep it in a bag, which is how I keep all of the decks that I use. I keep in bags and I hang them on the wall. But this one clearly cannot handle that. And then I was storing it pressed between books. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was a problem. It was a problem. And maybe this sounds very, very shallow because the deck quality, I think the content in this deck is really, really good. <laughs> but I could not 
with this warping cardstock. And like every time I shuffled it, like I'm, I'll shuffle it now. It just, it got, look at, it got so much worse. I don't know if you can tell. Okay, maybe, maybe at this point I'm just mad at it, but like if I hold it loosely, I'm gonna hold it loosely and just pinch at one end, you can see maybe how badly warped. It's so badly warped, I don't understand. Anyways, but I really love the guidebook. And if you're curious about this, the, the meatiness, the, the substance in the guidebook is so, so good. And you get keynotes, symbology, guidance, a bit about your environment and life architecture, cornerstones and powerful nodes. Um, this deck, this card is an icon, is a portal. There's practices, there's creative prompts, ecological connections. It's so good. It's so good, which is what makes me so sad because I know I won't work with it if it's so aesthetically displeasing. And again, I recognize that makes me sound shallow AF, but if it's unpleasant to physically handle, I'm not going to enjoy working with it. So this one has got to go, um, but I'm super sad. and. Truly, if this were to come out in better cardstock, I would love to see it actually, even if it's round. It's fine if it's round. Just give me cardstock that doesn't warp. I, I don't know what that is. But um, yeah, anyways, I was super gutted. But it is a really, really good, the content, the quality, the book, the art, no complaints about the substance of the deck. It's purely production quality. So hopefully it can get sorted out maybe on a future edition or reprint or something. If y'all ever find out if it gets better, let me know, please, because I will bring it back in. I loved it that much. But in the meantime, I am consoling myself with, albeit another deck whose card stock I kind of hate, but I can handle it. And that is the Witch's Wisdom Tarot. There's my bag. See, it's got a pentacle on it. Um, the Witch's Wisdom Tarot. This is the one by Phyllis Curat with art by Danielle Barlow. I really, really, really love the substance of this deck. And while the cardstock is very kind of like stiff and difficult to shuffle, I still really love this deck and I would not rehome it for the cardstock. It's manageable. It's not warped. It's just a little bit stiff, you know, and it's a little big. There is a different version of this deck that is in the works that I believe will have a smaller guidebook. So this more deluxe edition with the like linen-y finish guidebook is going away. The cards will be, I believe, smaller. I don't know what the changes to the cardstock are going to be. Um, I'm definitely holding on to this until I see what that new one is like and have worked with it for a while, but I'll probably get the new one just to see. Um, but anyways, I'm not even showing you cards. The thing about the Witch's Wisdom is that it also feels very connected to the land, to earth. It's got that, to me, feels like it has that ecological connection but uh, it's easier for me to work with. I also really love the book and the book also in The Witch's Wisdom has um, a practice. So you get for every card, you get the wisdom, the essence, counsel, which is kind of like advice, and then magic, a spell or some kind of practice you can do. So I feel like this ticks off a lot of the same boxes. Um, and so I don't need the Kantiki uh, Oracle, but I really would, I really would like it. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I have the Witch's Wisdom so I can survive not having the Kantigi, at least for the time being. Next up, I have decided that I'm probably not going to be keeping my Gentle Tarot Pocket Edition. I freaking love this deck. This is not a statement on this deck at all. I probably shouldn't have gotten this because I really do love my Gentle Tarot full size. I am tempted to get the Linen Edition, but I felt the Linen Edition and I, I actually really like the Standard Edition. The cardstock is a little bit stiffer, but it feels so luxurious to touch and it shuffles really nicely. I like the size of the cards. So I love the matte gold edging, but I really like my original full size Gentle Tarot. Uh, and I really, I love the little guidebook that comes with the basic deck, with the standard, not basic, with the standard deck. I love the guidebook that comes with it, but I also have the big, juicy, delicious, <laughs> apparently everything's food now, guidebook that uh, Mari put out in the Kickstarter when she released this little pocket deck. The only reason I don't wanna keep the pocket deck, like I said, is it, it's a duplicate and this card stock, I feel like the pocket would have done so much better to have a linen card stock, like her actual linen edition, or something maybe even a little thinner than this, I don't know if it's the shape or the size, but it just, it it's just a little stiff to try to shut, see I still can't do it. Like, I it, There's something, I, every time I try to like ripple it, like the cards don't wanna like stack. I think it's, there's something about the size of the shape or the stiffness of the cardstock. I cannot get them to riffle shuffle. And there are other pocket decks I have that also don't riffle shuffle. But with this pocket edition, I know I'm gonna wanna grab either this smaller guidebook or the big guidebook. At which point, why not just grab the full size? Like, I feel like I don't, 
We'll see. I mean, I'm going to be putting, and I'm like kind of talking myself out of getting rid of it because it's so dang cute and the production quality is really lovely. And it's got these like little golden, okay, this is an anti holly. So can you focus? The point is, <laughs> the point of this is I probably don't need this other copy. Um, so I am considering, and it comes in such a great little round, soft cornered embossed tin. It's so cute. Um, I just don't think I'm going to use this mini version. I've had it for a while. I've had no need to use it. Every time I've wanted to work with the Gentle Tarot, I've just grabbed my full size. I don't do the kind of travel where I would be grabbing this deck as a portable. Um, I don't know. I just, I really like my original one. So I have my original. I don't need the pocket, but this is probably going to go in my purgatory for a while before I let it go. Because if I find that I'm wanting it in this size, I might pull it back out of purgatory. We'll see then. But for now, I'm probably not, I'm not keeping it in rotation at any point, at any rate, I should say. So those are all the decks that I have to share with you that I'm not keeping. Now it's time to talk about mass market decks I'm not gonna buy. And the first of these is the Four Hoxa Tarot. Now I have previously talked about this in a previous anti-haul. I'm sure there was a less clunky way to say that, but that's, you get what you get here on the channel. <laughs> Anyways, I really wanted that deck. I was really curious. I heard lots and lots of good things. I swear to goodness, I definitely watched walkthroughs. I'm sure of it. But I hesitated because buying it from uh, the creator directly was going to be really expensive to get it here in Canada. And historically, um, MJ Colinane's decks have tended to go mass market. And um, I'm pretty sure several people swore up and down this one wasn't going to go mass market. But lo and behold, it's now on pre-order for mass market. So I thought, okay, I'll get it mass market. I was going to get it. Like it was literally in my cart. And then I saw Christy over at Crochet Witch Tarot and Andy of uh, Metaphysics Made Easy. They got together to do a video response of VR to the 21 tarot questions tag, which has been going around a lot. And I'm loving the responses, by the way. Oh my God, so much fun. Um, but anyways, they got together and did a stream. And during that stream, Andy showed the four Hoxa and she was flipping through cards. And then she got to the eight of swords, which I, um, if you are arachnophobic, just like fast forward 30 seconds. But anyways, I will put the picture up real quick. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, I about jumped out of my skin when I saw this image. I was like, there is no way. Now I can be squeamish about spiders. I have several decks with spiders in them and they're fine. I can work with them. It's okay. This one was the stuff of nightmares. I literally can't. I couldn't even objectively think about the rest of the deck, whether or not I like it, whether or not I was really going to hit buy on it. Because as soon as I saw that card, I was like, I would have been gutted. If I had paid the independent price tag for that deck and gotten that in and seen that card, I would have been so sad because it would have cost me a lot. I don't know. I feel like, I again, I'm sure I must have seen it. I'm sure I must have seen it, but I have no recollection. Probably because I blocked it out. That, that makes sense. Um, but anyways, I'm definitely not getting that deck. And when it comes to fun fey decks, my favorite has tended to always be, as far as tarot goes, the uh, Tarot of the She. I love this deck. Um, I, my version is modified so the side borders are taken off. And I think this brings a lot of that wild fey energy forward. I know some people find this deck really creepy. I love it. Um, that's what the backings look like. This feels so connected to the wild, which is what I go to decks like this for. Decks like this, decks like the Brian Froud Fey Oracle really scratch that itch for me. I think the Four Hoxa was a little bit of a curiosity purchase for me, but I mean, I think I probably would have brought it home if I hadn't seen that card on that video that, that um, Krista and Andy did. So I'm so grateful <laughs> that I saw that because it saved me some money for sure. But yeah, so I'm not going to get the Four Hoxa mass market. I am Seriously still in love with the Tarot of the She. I love this deck and it's great for this time of year. The other mass market deck I've decided to hold off on, and let me tell you, there are quite a few mass market decks that have seriously caught my attention. So it was actually hard to find decks for this category, but the other one that I was really, 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 really close to hitting buy on and managed to stop myself is the Anne Stokes Gothic Oracle. This deck is so lovely. I love Anne Stokes artwork. It brings me right back to 90s fantasy art. I think it's fantastic. There are unicorns, there are dragons in the same deck. It was very, 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 very tempting. And on one hand, I would say I've got two things sort of scratch the itch for this for me. The first is I created a bit of a combined deck. I both use them separately and use them together. I didn't bring them because I forgot. Uh, the Paolo Barbieri Star Dragon and uh, Unicorn 
Oracle decks, they're a little slim, each one, but I like to combine them for sort of dragon unicorn combined energy or separate them for dragon unicorn readings. Hi, Peggy and I have, have the kind of dragon unicorn energy going on. So I really like that idea. But actually, I was really drawn to it because I felt like it would bring me into the dark a little bit. And I don't have a lot of oracles that have that darker vibe. So I thought that would be what would make me sort of hit by on it. I talked myself out of it because I was recently, like not very long ago actually, gifted a copy of the Earth, Moon, and Shadow. Now, the creator gifted this deck to me, the Earth, Moon, and Shadow Oracle, um, when I was talking about going through some stuff. And it was really, really kind of her to send it because when she sent this to me, I wanna be very clear, this deck was basically almost sold out on her website. She had nothing to gain by sending it to me. It was just a very kind gesture and one that I really appreciated and came at a time when I really needed it. Um, but this is a really wonderful Shadow Oracle. I believe it is currently sold out so I'm sorry for showing it I don't know if there are plans to reprint I would assume there are but I don't I don't know that for sure uh, I would definitely say reach out to Serafina the creator if you're curious but this really has that sort of darker aesthetic but the cards are not dark right the cards are still very very colorful they lean a little bit deeper in tone but they really cover a lot of shadowy topics so it's really great for shadowy style readings shadow work type readings or just supportive readings if you're doing some of the healing work that comes with needing to acknowledge the more difficult sides of life so i really do enjoy having this i have not worked with it a ton yet but it is one that i feel like i want to spend time getting to know and really becoming super comfortable with before i bring another sort of darker themed or shadowy themed oracle into the mix of my collection but that is the earth moon and shadow oracle and this is just what i decided from my own collection would sort of scratch the itch for the ann stokes deck although that 90s fantasy artwork vibe is, is still a it's still a thing it's still a thing i really like so now let's talk about indie decks that i have talked myself out of there are several i have a lot of feelings let's get into it this first one was one that I've talked myself out of in the past, but there was so much hype, and that is the sort of anything around the Yonase Yaus, I hope I'm saying that right, decks. Um, the Yonase Yaus deck itself is not very tempting to me. It's a little too abstract, a little too numerological and floral, and I don't know, I just, it's not my thing. But I've had several people comment thinking that I would like the Stunning Tarot by Yonase Yaus. Now, by the time I, I really heavily considered this, it was completely sold out anyways. I don't get it i get that the art is really beautiful it just feels like when these decks come up for pre-order uh, any edition of the yonasi yaus or the newer editions of the stunning tarot they just sell out so fast and i have a real hard time buying into the hype if that makes sense i don't want to feel rushed to make a decision even with kickstarters most of the time now i will hit save on them and i will watch them and then i will back them nearer to the end of their campaign i'm not saying that's what everybody should do but i like having the time to really think about a purchase before I make it, except on the times when I literally don't think at all and just back things fairly impulsively, which I also do, or purchase things impulsively. I for sure do that. But I try to aim towards being more thoughtful and considered about my purchases in general, partly because I do have so much, right? So with the Stunning Tarot, I looked at a ton of walkthroughs. I really came close to purchasing this. Again, if I could have. I guess I shouldn't say I came close to purchasing it. I came very, very close to putting it on my list for the next time it came up for pre-order because I had missed the pre-order. But anyways, I really took some time to consider whether or not I wanted to bring this into my collection. And I managed to, to sort of talk myself through it and out of it by remembering that I got a deck that sort of gives me the same feel. I don't know if you'll agree that this is similar, but I recently got and have just been really, really getting along with the whole Tarot of the Holy Spectrum, the Infinity Edition. Oh, be prepared for lots of light in your, wow, I'm making rainbows on my wall because that's, wow, it's so shiny. Anyways, um, I don't know what it is about this deck. Um, I got this because of Marlena, 100% because of Marlena. Uh, Marlena Teresa, who is here on YouTube. Uh, why aren't you watching Marlena Teresa if you're not already? I'll, I'll link her channel down below. But anyways, um, this is one of Marlena's favorite decks, if not her favorite deck. Um, although I feel like the Thoth is really climbing up there for her. But anyways, she's the one who got me to buy this. And I was hanging out with her and Don Michelle on one of Don's member live streams. And we were talking and she was like showing this deck or talking about this deck. I did not like the original um, oh, Tarot of Holy Spectrum. I totally glitched. I couldn't remember the name. I didn't like the original one. It was a little too, there was something about the colors. It was too muted or too dark or something. I can't remember. But this one is like, oh my gosh, I love the colors. The backs are obnoxious and they get so many fingerprints on them. And weirdly, 
I leave them. Like it gets packaged with like a cloth so you can wipe the fingerprints off, but there's something about my fingerprints being all over this. This probably sounds gross, but there's something about my fingerprints being all over this that makes this deck feel like it's mine in a way that's like, I'm sure right up there with like a dog peeing on a hydrant or something. Like it's, it's can't possibly be like a charming quality about me, but like there's something about my, 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 my fingerprints being all over this that just makes me happy. I, I don't know. I think it's in the same way that I like decks that are, that I've had for a long time that are kind of like damaged because I've used them so much. There's something about that that I really enjoy. <laughs> what does that say about me? I don't, I don't know. It's like, it's mine. It's mine. You can't have it. I don't know. Anyways, the Terror of the Holy Spectrum, I should show and stuff while I'm talking. It's just so vibrant and colorful and it reads so well. Like, look at this. This is the five of, is this the five of swords? Five of wands. Five of wands. But there's, it's really unique. It's got this kind of dystopian sort of vibe. But do you see what I mean when I'm comparing this to the, the stunning tarot by Yonasa Yaus? Do you see, are you picking up what I'm putting down about how they're kind of similar? Like, do you, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. Maybe it's just the way that the colors are done. Um, but it gives me stunning tarot vibes. They're nothing alike. I, somebody out there will understand me. And if you are one of the people that understands me, please comment down below and let me know so that I don't feel crazy. But like, like look at this six. Excuse me, four. You know, I can't, it's okay. I can't, I can't read anything, but look at that. There's something about, like, I've gotten just enough work done. I can go do stuff now. Or the six of swords with the different perspective. And I, I have to admit, I'm also just a sucker for the color. This is not the best card stock I've ever felt in my life. It's like glossy and the deck has this, like, what do you call this? This, this bow that goes this way. Um, I don't know, but I like it. I like it a lot. There's no guidebook. I just really enjoy working with this deck. So this one is why I don't and don't plan to get the stunning tarot after all. I make no promises about the next one. There is a chance that I will cave at some point because I really kind of want it, but I'm trying to talk myself out of it because I think it just, it definitely competes very closely with something else I want to continue to appreciate as much as I do. And we're talking about the Alice in Tarot Land tarot. Part of, okay, I blame whoever in the Supportive Tarot Facebook group posted asking people about their favorite linen finish tarot decks because linen finish tarot is like my favorite. It's my favorite. I love linen finish so much. It's a really lovely playing card style cardstock. It shuffles beautifully. They hold up well. They're, they're, they're not stiff. They're, oh, I just love linen finish so much. But anyway, somebody posted saying, can you tell me all your favorite linen? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be shopping this entire thread now. Thanks a lot. Uh, but somebody mentioned Alice in Tarot Land and I'm like, huh? So I, I look it up, I Google it, I find it on Etsy. I will have links to everything I'm talking about down below. Um, and it's this Rider Waite Smith clone, but it's using the artwork, as far as I can tell, the actual artwork from the, um, I forgot the artist's name all of a sudden because my memory sucks. But anyways, you know, the original art from the classic book, books and collaged it and it's very readable. It's very, it's very much a Rider Waite Smith clone, but with these characters and I love the collage and I love the black and white Harlequin pattern around the cards. And I just, I love so much about it. I really, really do. And it's been sitting in my Etsy cart. It's it's kind of expensive to bring into Canada. And I'm like, and it's linen. And I'm like, it's so shuffleable. I, I really kind of want it. I mean, I'm, I really kind of want it. I don't know how thoroughly I've talked myself out of it. But for now, I'm holding off uh, because I have the beautiful Baba Studios Alice Tarot. And I love this deck. And this deck was also very expensive. And it's also on lo like lovely cardstock. Um, this, first of all, I miss these Baba Studios boxes. Their new decks that are coming out do not have these gorgeous custom printed boxes. They have wooden boxes, which you would think would be this like really great quality step up. And I suppose for some of us it will be, but these boxes are convenient and I can, they're light and I can put these into a tarot bag and hang them on my wall. Um, but the new decks are coming out with wooden boxes and I'm, I'm not about it, but uh, I do, I do love this. But anyways, Bob, Baba Studios cardstock is also thin. It's very shuffleable, shuffleable. Is that the right word? Shuffleable? Yeah. It's very shuffleable. It holds up really nicely. Um, it, it just, it shuffles so beautifully. It feels almost shockingly thin when you get a Baba Studios deck in. I want you to know, but it holds up so beautifully. It feels lovely. Anyways, I love the Baba Studios Alice. It's very well thought out. The artwork is exquisite. 
It's all original. It's been done with photos and collage, and it's got this beautiful cold foil stamping. And this is a subtler cold foil stamping than what Baba Studios has done on their other decks, and I love the subtlety. It's like the perfect amount. I wish they would do this level of cold stamping for all of their uh, foil stamped decks because it's just, it's very, it never obscures the art. It just works with it so beautifully and gives it this hint of shimmer, and it's, I love it so much. But anyway, I... I really, really love this deck, and my fear is that, oh, this, this one is so good. My fear is that if I bring home the Alice in Tarotland, because it's easier in a way to work with, because it's that simple Rider Waite Smith clone imagery, that this one will then be neglected. And I want to use this. Every time I want to think of, a, of using an Alice themed tarot, I want it to be this one. I want this one to get as much play in my collection as possible, which is the only reason I have managed to talk myself out of the Alice in Tarotland, but I want it. I want it. And my fear though is that I will get it and bring it home and then because I still want to love this one so so much and use this one so much that I will end up rehoming the Alice in Tarot Land and then what have I done? I've just spent the money to bring it in and then I end up sending it back out and I'm trying to avoid that kind of cycle where I can by making these thoughtful decisions up front, you know? And I definitely did that. I had the Queen Alice Tarot and I ended up eventually moving it out because I just didn't want anything competing with my original Baba Studios Alice. So there you have it, folks. This next one, I'm probably not gonna be able to shut up about. We're gonna be here for like another hour with me talking about this because I have been agonizing and agonizing and agonizing about the Terra Volatile. It is up for pre-order at the time I'm filming this right now with a beautiful stitch-bound, hard-bound, glorious book going into it. The original deck, the expansion pack, I want it all. And I did the math and to bring home the book, the deck, and the expansion so that I could make my perfect personalized Terra Volatile deck, it would be $240 Canadian, minus two or $3, depending on the exchange on any given day. 200, roughly 240 bucks, let's just round up, 240 bucks Canadian for me to get everything. And I, every time I look at this deck, I want this deck. But every time I talk to anybody who knows me even a little bit about this deck, they're like, Lisa, you're not gonna use this deck. And the funny thing is, I agree with them. And part of me is like, but maybe I just wanna collect it. Maybe this is one of those ones I want to have just to have. And I, I, I'm not going to guarantee you that I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna get this because I can't get it out of my dang mind. I don't know what it is. I, I know partly what it is. Dustin and Danny love it a lot. I respect Dustin and Danny. Um, I, I want, everything they want, even when most of the time that's not how our aesthetics work, that's not how our taste in tarot works, but I want it. And the suit on alchemy excites me because I love um, the idea of working with a whole full suit worked into the rest of the tarot to talk about the different stages of alchemy, that really excites me. The artwork excites me even when, even though I know that decks that have this style of artwork are decks I don't tend to reach for. But it's, I can sit back and look at it objectively as this incredible piece of art and this incredibly serious but also deep, well thought out tarot deck and think, I want that. Like, I want that. I want to study that. I want to sit with it. I want to look at it. I want to play with it. And it's linen, which we already know is a major weakness. So I want it. And so I've, I've looked at it in all kinds of configurations. I looked at multiple walkthroughs of the expansion pack, which by the way, there have been multiple changes, so that gets confusing. But anyway, I'm pretty sure that the current version of the deck, just the deck, is almost exactly what I would want as far as, it comes with some alternative cards already, so everything I would kind of want in my deck is already in the base deck, with the singular exception of the High Priestess. I prefer the High Priestess in the expansion pack. I don't prefer pretty much almost any of the other cards in the expansion pack, except for the High Priestess. And it's silly to get the expansion pack just for the High Priestess. So I'm like, okay, maybe I don't need the expansion pack. That brings my cost down a little bit. Okay, cool. Maybe I don't need the big book because I have a big glorious book for the Deviant Moon Tarot. And while that was an, a wonderful experience and I, I love that book and I treasure that book, when I'm working with the Deviant Moon Tarot, I do not haul out this big ass book to work with it, right? I, I look at that separately. So practically speaking, do I need the big giant Terra Volatile book? Probably not because they have a full guide online, like a PDF, I think you even get a PDF guidebook. So I don't need this big fancy book. I mean, but I kind of want it, you know? So I'm like, okay, well, if I don't need the book and I don't need the expansion, that makes the price much more reasonable. And so it sat in my cart, just the deck. And I'm like, I can just get the deck. And then later maybe I can get the book if it doesn't go out of stock. So I'm like trying to work this out. But I keep coming back to the fact that I feel like I will bring it in and I'll be super excited. And when it comes to like picking a deck for readings, 
for others, for myself. I just won't pick it. So I'm talking myself out of it. But yeah, but y'all kind of want it. I mean, I kind of want it. <laughs> but I'm not. I, I just, it doesn't seem practical to me. So I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be intelligent about <laughs> how I work with tarot and be really, really brutally honest with myself because I, pro I probably don't need it. And that's the whole point of this process is like reminding myself I don't need all the things. I can enjoy other people enjoying the things. I can enjoy looking at the things online. I can watch walkthroughs of the thing. I do not need to own the thing to appreciate the thing. And I, I suppose that's part of the point of this video series. It's like me going through that process and sharing with you the process I go through to try to figure out what's for me and what's not for me. And the thing I'm consoling myself with at the moment that I already have and that I do enjoy using, but don't use enough to make me think I should get more in this category, <laughs> is the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus by Robert M. Place. I'm gonna bring it in front of my face to make sure it focuses. Um, this is the, it says an iconic edition. I don't actually know what edition this is. Um, I think this was the first edition. I'm pretty sure this is the first one that came out. Anyway, I really loved Robert M. Place's Alchemical Tarot, but it was a lot. It was a lot for me to look at. Also see, see, this is why I probably shouldn't get the tarot Terra Volatile. But anyways, um, I ended up really liking this because it's very explicitly about alchemy, but it's also a very readable deck all on its own. So it comes with a little white book, but I also have uh, Robert M. Place's um, Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, big giant book, which is incredible and so worth a read. But anyways, um, so I've studied the alchemical tarot. I've, I have that book to reference if I want to get in deep to write the alchemy piece. But the neat thing about this deck, so this is the backs of the Tarot of Alchemical Mag Mag Magnum Opus. These are the fronts. Is that where you experience where you where you pull a card that is connected to the um, alchemical process? Such as here we have the chariot, which is associated with sublimation. It says sublimation right on it. You don't need to memorize anything. It says right on it what alchemical phase is being depicted, and it's a pip deck. But it's a really great pip deck. It's a pip deck with um, enough art to bring you back to the Rider Waite Smith. The pips are incredibly intelligent. This is more of a reference, I feel like, to. Um, there's a different deck that that five with the fingers, the flames coming out, I can picture it, but anyway. Most of the pips here reference RWS imagery. But then the majors, like coagulation for the devil, references the alchemical process. And the little white book does a great job of reminding you what that process is. I just, this is such a great little alchemy deck. So like, do I need the, the Terra Volatile to get into the alchemical process? No. And I also have another deck, which I'm not using because it's in the process of a rather extensive modification that I'm doing on it. But I also have the Wild Messengers Alchemical Tarot um, that goes into the alchemy a bit and is a little bit more my style in some ways than, you know, others. But like, if I want a serious tarot about alchemy, I have that. I have that. So I'm good. I don't need the Terra Volatile. And this is so much more usable to me and I'm more likely to reach for this than I am the Terra Volatile. So for that reason, whew, I talked myself out of it. Y'all, I have so much to say about all these. I'm so sorry. We're just gonna, we're gonna be here a while. I, this is probably gonna be a really long video. I'm just, I'm making peace with it. I hope you've made peace with it too. I hope you have something, maybe you're doing laundry right now or maybe you need to do your dishes. If you have not done your dishes, maybe take me into the kitchen with you and then like get your dishes done, you know, or get your laundry switched over. Do whatever you need to do because I am, I'm not rushing my way through this. So the next one I wanna talk about that I had to talk myself out of, oh, is that it for Indy? Oh, that's it for Indy. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about Kickstarters. I managed to, not back, <laughs> uh, despite being very, very tempted. The first of these is the Magic Cottage Oracle. The entire line of decks by this creator is 100% my aesthetic. It's storybook. You know what I feel like these decks would go really well with is like the Northern Animal Tarot, which I don't have, but I like the way that they, they kind of vibe on each other, you know? The thing about the Magic Cottage Oracle is I feel like there's this world building that's been done around the characters in this deck and the creator's former decks. And I have not gotten any of their decks, but I feel like if I got one of their decks, I'd wanna get all of their decks. And I'm pretty sure I talked about this when I covered this deck in my hot takes, but I went back to this Kickstarter campaign so many times after that hot takes video. I think it was a live that I filmed with Peggy, if I remember right. Um, I went back so many times, looking at it, being tempted by it. <sighs> like Lisa, Lisa, you don't need it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. You don't need it. You'll get sucked in. And it'll be bad. So I've managed to not. I managed to not. I talked myself out of it. I made it through. Here I sit. And the deck that scratches the itch for me um, is the Bohemian Animal Tarot. This is such a great, whimsical, but it's still an RWS clone. Also an excellent beginner's deck, by the way. It's mass market. It's really clever. 
Um, the guidebook is very well done and very, very beginner friendly. And I always forget about this when I get asked questions, like in the 21 tarot questions, one of the questions is your favorite, like what would you would give to a beginner? And like this should be on that list for sure. It's just very, very well done. And the guidebook is incredibly thorough. It's storybook. It's whimsical. It's got that cartoonish element. This is the deck that I love for me. And I like this better than the Northern Animal Tarot. And I think it's because this deck is less dark. I've also done a lot of ancestor work with this deck, which I know that's been a requested topic for my Magic of Divination video series. I'm going to try to remember to talk about how I do ancestor work um, in a video soon, so keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, maybe I'll put that up in the fall. We'll see, we'll see. But anyways, this Bohemian Animal Tarot is definitely the deck that scratches the itch when I'm tempted by decks like the Magic Cottage Oracle. And I get that this is a tarot and that was an oracle, but I feel like you can kind of, you can use an oracle in the same way that you use a tarot and vice versa. So, you know, that whether it's tarot oracle is not as big of a deal to me. The next deck that I, now this one I caved in the middle of a member live stream, I believe. I caved and backed it. And then I backed out of it, um, which I try not to do because I feel like it, it's just gonna, it just gives gray hairs to deck creators who are like seeing people like back and then unback and back and unback. I try not to do that. I try to be clear before I back, but a couple of times I have unbacked, like three or four in total, I think. But anyways, this is one of those. And it is the Aphrodite Tarot. I have to admit the pink <laughs> definitely sucked me in. And also the fact that it's entirely Aphrodite themed. Uh, Aphrodite was my first sort of matron goddess that I worked with. I worked with her for a long time. And in certain circles, I had a nickname associated with my association with Aphrodite. It was like a whole thing when I was a baby witch in my pagan circles when I was like, like, I was gonna do this, like I was short. I was not short, I was like 19. But like, anyways, way back then, when I was first getting into all of this witchy, tarot-y stuff, um, Aphrodite was like, she was my girl. She was like my goddess. So I was really, really tempted by this. And I had backed it going, you know what? I, I just want, I just want it. <sighs> but I went back and looked after I backed and I started looking at more of the images and they, on my computer screen, they looked a little bit grainy or something. There was something about them that looked like they weren't quite as maybe sharp as I'd want them to be. And I was worried I was gonna get this deck in and not like it aesthetically, like that it wasn't going to quite fit the bill. I worried that I was too impulsive. I, I'm going to be keeping an eye on it, but I did pull out of the campaign. I'm like, mm, I, don't, I think this, I feel like this is one that will, I will be underwhelmed by when I get it in. No fault of the creators, of course. Like it looks like it's definitely a, a labor of love for sure. Oh, see what I did there with love? Anyway. I talked myself out of it and artistically, I have another deck that's similar in style that I, I'm sure that I could work with if I wanted to connect with Aphrodite. Uh, and that is the Tarot of Delphi. Now this is an out of print, hard to find deck. I know, I'm so sorry. This was gifted to me. I am incredibly blessed to have had this gifted to me. Um, it is, I hope one day to be reprinted. I, I really truly hope it's just really well done. Oh, I'm throwing cards. Oh no. Now this isn't pink but it definitely hits the same notes as the Aphrodite tarot did. And I really like how well, um, how like sort of uh, clear the images are in the Tarot of Delphi. I feel like that's done very well. And it's a beautiful deck. It's a slow reader, it slows me down, which I really enjoy. But it's got that same sort of like languid, beautiful, softness to it that I feel like the Aphrodite tarot had. But we see more characters, of course, in here than just Aphrodite, right? We have all kinds of things going on. I think in the end, this is probably a more usable deck to me and is definitely a collector type item that I would, I can't imagine ever parting with. Um, and I'm not sure that the Aphrodite tarot would have slotted in quite as well with this already in my collection. So that's why I talked myself out of the Aphrodite Tarot. The next tarot that I talked myself out of is the Animal and Botanical Tarot. This one looks uh, so well done, so beautiful. I try real hard to rein it in when it comes to animal decks because I feel like I already have too many and there's none that I currently have that I wanna part with. I have the Brady Tarot, I have the Pacific Northwest Tarot, but specifically this one combines, this Animal and Botanical obviously combines animals and botanicals. But I do have something in my collection that does that and does it very well and it's super affordable. And it is the Woodland Wardens Oracle. If you do not have this and you like nature decks, you like animal decks, you like botanical decks, I highly, highly recommend. This is affordable and it is 
lovely. It's so well done. This is by Jessica Rue. Um, the card stock is like, it doesn't feel very nice. I feel like when I first touch it, it feels like it might be kind of cheap or something, but it shuffles nicely. It doesn't warp like the Kantigi warped. I'm just saying like it, it's held up nicely. I've shuffled the heck out of this and it pairs really beautifully with decks like the Oak Ash and Thorn or the Brady Tarot. And it is animals and botanicals. You get an herb or a plant of some kind matched with the animal. And it tells you right on the card what it is. So this is wolf and rose hip. And then it gives you a keyword, guardianship. And then when you get into the guidebook, it actually tells you how both the wolf and rose hip apply to this meaning, guardianship. It makes its point. And it even gives you journal prompts. So a couple of questions at the end of every entry to prompt you to do your writing, or I like to sometimes use those prompts to draw tarot cards beside the Oracle deck. This is a really, really fantastic Oracle deck, well worth the money. And so I have animals and botanicals, you know, covered already. So I don't need a whole tarot that does the job of a deck I've already got. So talked to myself out of it. The next Kickstarter I almost backed and pulled back from is the Lilifer Tarot Gold Edition. Whew. Okay, so I backed the original Lila for Tarot, and when I got it in, it was so luxurious to touch. The, the, the production quality was beautiful. I loved the size. I loved the squishy bodies and the funky artwork, um, but I just could not use it. it I felt like I, I had a hard time knowing what card was what. It felt a little too chaotic for me personally. It was just the style of it. Um, I couldn't do it. And I ended up rehoming the one that I got. I ha had even trouble filming a walkthrough for it. I just really struggled, but I, I appreciated it as a piece of art. I just, it wasn't usable for me. And then I found out with this Lila for Gold edition that's coming out on Kickstarter is that there's been some quality of life sort of upgrades to the deck. So now there are uh, number notations so you know which minor arcana cards you're in. And I'm assuming the elemental is already on there too. There's um, clear labels on the court cards. And there's these sweet gold embellishments, but it, the main thing to me was that it seems like the titling was going to be upgraded in a way that was going to make the deck much more usable. And I felt like that's all I remembered not working for me. And so I'm like, I should do it because otherwise I loved the deck, right? But I, I feel like I've gone this long without it and I haven't necessarily missed it per se. So a deck that I didn't enjoy enough or um, get along with enough to get past a simple labeling issue is not probably one I should bring back. That's what I kept thinking was like, well, if I had liked the deck otherwise, if I had really bonded with the deck otherwise, and it was just this labeling issue, I could have labeled them myself. I've, I've labeled my own cards before, but something held me back from doing that. And it just, something about that deck didn't gel with me. And I think it's like that whole absence makes a heart grow fonder. It's like, I was remembering it more fondly than I obviously had enjoyed it in person, or I wouldn't have passed it along as quickly as I did. So I need to trust myself is the thing. So I decided not to back it. And I console myself with the fact that um, the other deck by Marian Costenton that y'all know, I love this deck and it is the Reclaim Oracle. And it's by the same creator. I get my wonderful squishy bodies. I get a deck that I love working with that is wonderful for shadow work, for, just identifying emotion, moving through emotion. If, I've never seen another deck do this so well, but it's very, um, it's very in your face about it for sure. But you have all of these named emotions and these illustrations that like so perfectly illustrate each emotion. This is such an, a, an incredible deck. And I think it's that I loved this deck so much that I wanted the Lilifer to work for me, but the Lilifer, it's not for me and that's okay. And I just had to like, talk myself through the process, but I do stinking love my Reclaim Oracle. I love it so much. And um, it's completely safe in my collection. I have not been tempted to get different editions of this or expansion packs for this or any of the other stuff, but I really just love this original first edition Reclaim Oracle. It is my favorite and it's in a perfect bag and it has this sweet patch that Peggy sewed onto my bag for me that says emotional baggage, which I love. Um, this is just, I love this. I love this. So I don't need Lilifer to appreciate Marion Costenton's, I, I probably just slaughtered her name, but Marion Costenton's artwork. Um, I don't need, I don't need to get the Lilifer. We're good. And lastly, the final deck that I convinced myself not to buy is, or back on Kickstarter, is the Thoth Journey Tarot. Now, I have very few Thoth decks in my collection, 
because it's not my favorite system. It's just not. I've studied it. I appreciate it. There's things about it I really, really enjoy. But in general, Thoth is not sort of home turf for me at all. But this Thoth journey is like one of the prettiest Thoth tarots I've ever seen. And I, I, I wanted it. <laughs> I wanted it. It didn't make sense, but I wanted it. And I realized I don't need it. So I backed myself away from the ledge and I reached for the Thoth clone I do like. And it is the Asherah tarot. This is the pocket size. I'm currently using this actually for going through as part of the journey, going through the deck and walk with Marlena Teresa. So uh, it's working really beautifully for that. But this is the poker edition. It's linen. Y'all know how I feel about linen because I've said it 80 million times in this video. Uh, but anyways, it's really beautiful. I love the colors. I love the mandalas. It's very, very thothy. It's not, a, a, I shouldn't call it a thoth clone. I don't think that's entirely fair. But it does a lot of the things that the thoth tarot does. It's clearly based on the thoth tarot. And I really find it beautiful. I enjoy looking at it. I'm throwing the cards. I enjoy looking at it. I enjoy the size. I enjoy shuffling it. It makes Thoth feel more approachable to me. I love this Two of Cups so much. The astrological glyphs on here are really easy to find. They're easy to spot in the cards. I really, I really just, I really enjoy this. So there's no point to me in getting yet another Thoth based deck because I don't use this Ashra Tarot very much because again, Thoth is not my home base. So when I want a Thoth that is workable for me, this is the one I will reach for. And if I if I don't want a Thoth-ish deck, I'll just reach for the Thoth. I still have the large regular edition of the Thoth that I usually keep, I keep mostly for reference, study slash reference. Um, so yeah, I don't really need a bunch of Thothy decks. <laughs> I have moved myself back in the middle of the screen, which means we are done. We are done with my anti haul. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope you all find these videos useful. I have been making these for a while. I really, 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 really enjoy talking about what I have, what I'm not buying, and also going through the process of leaning into what I have and not only about just what to buy or what to bring in. It's really easy to get caught up in bringing in all the new things and forgetting all the lovely, beautiful things you already have. At least that's the case for me. And so this exercise really creates that sense of being mindful, of checking myself, of not bringing in so many things that I get into a space of overwhelm or I start to feel like my decks, my tools are clutter. I don't want that. So this is me sort of you know, balancing that out. I try to make a new one of these every once in a while. So if this is something that you enjoy, definitely be sure and hit the subscribe button uh, and like this video if you found value in it or you enjoyed it. Those sorts of engagements really help the channel and I appreciate you all so, so much for doing that. And until next time, may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye.